So how did the settlement movement begin? Let's take a little look at modern history, modern Israeli history, uh, and bring us up to where we are today. How did the settlement movement begin? Well, I'd like to start that conversation actually with the beginnings of Zionism at the end of the 19th century. There was awakening among both religious and secular Jews at that time, mostly in Europe, but also in Yemen and some of the other places uh, around uh, the Middle East where there were uh, concentrated Jewish communities and people started to come to the land of Israel um, to live. It was a very poor start. The land was very unwelcoming. It was actually a very empty land. Uh, Jews struggled. Not all of them man made it. Uh, they did their best. They struggled with disease. They just struggled with poverty. They struggled with uh, oppression by the Ottoman Empire, the Turks who were then in control of the land. But the movement began. From the beginning, there was a vision uh, on the part of many in the Jewish community those who started the actual Zionist movement under Theodore Herzl. And that movement basically said, let's take the Jewish um, uh, hoping and, and praying and belief in a return to the land of Israel at some time, and let's turn that into a political reality. And then they began uh, lobbying various heads of state in Europe and doing whatever they could to facilitate the return of the Jews with the ultimate goal of creating an independent state. Um, in World War I, uh, we had the Ottoman Empire on, on the side of the Germans, and we had uh, the Allies, uh, including Gr Great Britain, uh, fighting against them. Uh, towards the end of that war, already in 1917, it became fairly clear that the Allies would defeat the Ottomans and the Germans in World War I. And so they already began to have discussions as to how they were going to divide up the spoils of the Ottoman Empire, which reached across most of North Africa and all the Middle East as we know it today. Um, it was right at that time that there was a, um, the Jewish community, the Zionist movement, had already um, worked very hard to plant the seed uh, in the British uh, governments and, and others, but the British is what became most uh, significant here, that uh, the land of Israel, that small little piece of land that was actually called Palestine at the time, it's Israel as we know it today, as well as Jordan as we know it today, that this would be set aside as a Jewish homeland ultimately to become an independent Jewish state. And in fact, towards the end of 1917, uh, just as the, um, the British-led forces were coming from Egypt up into the land of Israel and about to conquer the land of Israel from the Ottoman Empire, um, Lord Balfour uh, announced on behalf of uh, the British government that indeed the British government would view with favor the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Um, it took some time until the war was over and the Ottomans were defeated and driven from the Middle East. Uh, after the war, uh, there was immediate um, activity in order to implement the Balfour Declaration. And indeed, in the Treaty of San Remo a few years later, um, the British received what became known as the British Mandate for Palestine. Why was it a mandate? They were not given the land and say, okay, from now on, this is part of the British Empire. The area of Palestine was set aside as a Jewish homeland, and it was the role of the British to kind of nurture that into happening. They were supposed to administer the land and do whatever needed to be done to prepare the people, the Jewish people, for uh, independence and to work out uh, relationships between the people who were living in the land at the time. Now, um, at the time, there weren't that many Jews or Arabs or anybody living in the land. With the, we had, had some uh, population growth in the immediate decades before, um, before World War I, because Jews began coming into the land and developing the land economically, which in turn attracted Arabs coming in from the other Arab countries because opportunities were available. All that kind of ground to a halt during World War I. But after World War I, when the British came in, there was a real economic surge in the land. And Jews, of course, came in, in uh, seeking 
to this this promise of a Jewish homeland, seeking to be part of it, to help build up the land. But at the same time, with the growth of economic opportunities, more Arabs came into the land as well. Unfortunately, the British also had very close ties with Arabs in the area, had created a whole relationship in what became Saudi Arabia. Just to tell that story in a nutshell, um, the, uh, there was already oil and the British were very interested in the oil and that oil was located in the part of Arabia that at the time was um, under the control of the Saud family. And essentially the British made a deal that if the Saud family would align with them in World War I and in, uh, in helping them afterwards uh, to secure rights to the oil, then uh, the British in turn would ensure that all of Arabia would come under control of the Saud family. Now there was another family, however, that was uh, in charge of another area of Arabia, the area that included Mecca and Medina, and that is the Hashemite family. Um, and they uh, actually lost out because here the British made a, a deal with the Saud family because they had the oil. And the Hashemite family, who had been from the time of Muhammad, had been the guardians of the holy places of Islam, in this case, Mecca and Medina, um, they actually got the raw end of the stick. So why is this relevant? It's very relevant because right after receiving the mandate for Palestine, the British already did something quite surprising in a way. And really, it was the first retraction of the British from the original promise. If all of what is now Jordan and Israel was actually set aside as the mandate for Palestine for the establishment of a Jewish homeland. The uh, British right away took 74% of that land, which is Jordan as we know it today, and gave it to the Hashemite family as a compensation for the fact that they had taken away their rights in Arabia and handed it to the Saudi family. That's how we got the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Okay, but, at that point, even after that loss of that enormous piece of land, as you well know, uh, the biblical heart of Israel has always been that part of Israel west of the Jordan River. While there were two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh who dwelled east of the Jordan River in what is Jordan today, um, those were always considered kind of out of it. Uh, yes, it was always supposed to be part of or under Israelite influence. However, it was not the real it wasn't the land of Canaan. It wasn't the real land of Israel, the place that was central to Jewish existence and experience. So it was something that was acceptable and understandable, the fact that that part of the land went to the Jordanians. But there was expectation at that point that the British would fulfill the promise and over the next few years end up with the um, cooperation of the Jewish community, establish a Jewish state in what remained of Palestine. Unfortunately, government of Britain changed right after World War I, and so what we saw was a total uh, rejection of the original promises, and the British actually went out of their way to favor their Arabs, and this just got worse and worse. So as the Arabs realized that they might be uh, threatened by a Jewish state in an area that to them should have been an entire Arab Muslim area, um, they pressured the British, including through some very serious out breaks of um, violence. In 1929, for example, Arabs went on riotings and rampages all over the land of Israel, including in Hebron, where 70 Jews were murdered, hundreds more maimed, and the response of the British government at that time was to totally evacuate the Jewish community from Hebron. Now, this is a Jewish community that way predated the Zionist movement. There were Jews that had been living there since the 16th century. So this evacuation of the Jews was really the end of 400 years of Jewish life uh, in the heart of biblical Hebron. But uh, this is, was just one example of how the British were even then extremely tolerant of Arab activity, including violence, and created many, many obstacles against Jews, including uh, imposing severe restrictions on Jewish immigration to Israel. Now, if the Palestine was supposed to be established, was set aside for a Jewish homeland, how could you recognize, reconcile that with a British refusal to let most Jews come in and settle the land? 
this was the conflict that grew and grew over the years um, and created a tremendous conflict between the British on the one hand and the Jews of Israel on the other. Uh, that conflict kind of um, had a bit of a, a, a rest during World War II because the Jews appreciated that Britain was an important force in fighting Hitler. Uh, so that struggle was put on, on break for a while. In fact, there were many Jews in uh, Israel and then called Palestine who joined British, uh, the British army in order to help fight against Hitler. Uh, after World War II, the Zionist movement again became extremely active. And at this point, uh, the need for Jewish immigration to Israel was extremely urgent. Um, before the Holocaust, and this is something that I think is very important for people to understand, uh, when the British prevented Jews from entering uh, the land of Israel in the 20s uh, and the early 30s, that was about politics. When the British prevented Jews from entering the land of Israel from the late 30s, from the mid to late 30s and through the early 40s, what they did is condemned all those Jews to death at the hands of Hitler. Six million Jews were murdered by Hitler in the gas chambers in Europe where they could have been saved if they had been welcomed in the land of Israel. And there was a time before World War II began and even at the beginning of World War II where Hitler was very happy to let the Jews leave. He didn't necessarily have to kill them. He just wanted them out of, his, out of Europe. And if they had left, he would have been very happy. But the British would not let them in to Israel. After World War II, we had Holocaust survivors who were in DP camps all over Europe who wanted to get away from Europe, who wanted to go and settle in the land of Israel to be with Jews, among Jews, to set up a Jewish society where they as a society may have to struggle against their enemies, but they would not suffer in, in an anti-Semitic society. And even here with all these refugees who had gone through unspeakable horrors, would not let them into the land of Israel. That brings us to 1948, when finally the British realized they've had enough, they're leaving. May 15th, 1948 was the end of the British mandate. They left and the state of Israel was established. Now, from the beginning, there were offers being put forward to, uh, to Israel, to the Jewish community um, and to the Arabs uh, because the, the Arabs were complete, completely rejected the notion of a, a Jewish state anywhere in the land of Israel. And at each time, the Jews were willing to compromise, even though that meant um, preventing Jews from living in parts of the land of Israel that we all recognize are part of the land of Israel. But it was the Arabs who constantly rejected any compromise. And in fact, as soon as the British left, and even before, Arabs were already invading the land with the declared purpose of driving the Jews into the sea and uh, preventing any Jewish state from being established. Thank God they did not succeed. Uh, and uh, in 1949, there was the first ceasefire uh, that was a permanent ceasefire. It was actually an armistice. And um, the borders were drawn, but they weren't borders. They were merely ceasefire lines because the Arabs themselves continued in their rejectionism and refused to recognize Israel within any part of the land of Israel. So the, the part of, of Israel, as we know it today, that was occupied by Jordan was this area in the middle of the country, which became known as the West Bank. Uh, West Bank because it was west of Jordan. It's a name that was given to that area by the Jordanians uh, in order to express their determination that both west and east of the Jordan River were part of Jordan. That included, by the way, the old city of Jerusalem. The part of Jerusalem that remained in Israel's hands was a very, very small part of Jerusalem, what we call Western Jerusalem. The area of you may be familiar with around Ben Yehuda Street, Jaffa Street, those areas were in Israel's hands. Um, south, north, and east Jerusalem were all in the hands of Jordan. In fact, there was barbed wire uh, and soldiers at this line that actually uh, divided the city in half. The situation continued that way from 1949 to 1967, even though Israel was extremely vulnerable, was surrounded by enemies who never missed an opportunity to try and kill Jews. They were sending terrorists across the lines. They were doing whatever they could to uh, sabotage and, and to provoke Israel. Uh, but never did Israel plan a war. 
uh, a war just to get more land or just to see ourselves, for example, coming in to these great areas of land in the middle of Israel that were uh, occupied by Jordan. Now, I may remind you, in addition to the old city of Jerusalem, these areas that were occupied, occupied by Jordan included the Oak of Moreh, Shechem, Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, Jericho, Shiloh, Bethlehem, and Hebron. All these places that, as you well know, as readers of the Bible, were central to the Jewish possession of the land of Israel in biblical times and in post-biblical times. These areas were all in the hands of Jordan. But we would never have started a war to get those areas back as much as, to, to in our minds, they were ours. They belonged to us, but okay. If, if uh, circumstances are such that we, can, we don't have possession of them now, fine. We will manage with what we have and trust that one day circumstances will open themselves up so that we can go back into those areas. Well, those circumstances happened in 1967. Uh, this was a time when already Egypt and Syria were clearly on the verge of war with Israel, and Jordan was standing on the fence. They had no idea, sitting on the fence. They had, no, they had not decided if they were going to join Egypt and Syria and fighting against Israel, or they were going to stay out of it. In fact, Israel sent messages to the king of Jordan, uh, Hussein, who and, and, and warned him that if he were to uh, join this battle, that he would, you know, all, all bets off, Israel would fight against him. However, if he stayed out of the battle, Israel would respect the territorial integrity of this illegally occupied West Bank, by the way, um, and not touch Jordan. But Jordan was too uh, swayed by is Egypt and Syria believe the lies that Egypt was selling Jordan, that they were actually winning the war at a point which they had already clearly were losing the war, uh, and Jordan uh, entered the war. Uh, in just six days, Israel not only repelled the attacks on all three fronts, but pushed the Jordanians east of the Jordan River, which is where they have been ever since. This was an amazing victory. It wasn't just a victory of, of saving lives. I mean, on the eve of the Six Day War, I've heard people who, friends of mine who were children at the time, that they were helping to dig ditches and even graves because there was an expectation of uh, literally a massacre that would that would take place when Israel would be attacked by these countries with far superior armies, or at least that was the feeling at the time, certainly uh, more numerous uh, in, in weaponry and in, and in manpower. Uh, it was really a miracle that Israel won, but also part of this miracle, and in my opinion, one of the more significant parts of this miracle was the fact that Israel was now able to come back to what was the biblical heartland of Israel. And we were able to come back to the old city of Jerusalem. There was amazing outpouring of joy uh, at this ability to come back to the old city, to the Temple Mount, to the, to the Western Wall. And, and, you know, the declaration of Matagor, who was... Um, the general in charge of, of, the, of the capture of Jerusalem coming up to the Temple Mount and declaring for all the world to hear, the Temple Mount is now in our hands. So that was, these were moments of, of amazing emotional and spiritual uplifting uh, that really fanned out not just throughout Israel, but throughout the Jewish world, all over the world. I remember as a child uh, following this, I was not even 10 years old, and but but being so gripped in the passion and in and in, in the the tension of the time and then of course in the celebration of of the victory uh it was something that really remains with me to this day that amazing excitement that was just unleashed uh when we heard that we had won this war and walked out of this war with all these areas that were um, our biblical heritage uh, and Jerusalem, of course, as the crown of that amazing uh, accomplishment. Right after the war, uh, the question is, okay, what do you do? What do you do with all of this? And immediately, of course, the United Nations uh, met and they passed resolutions and the international uh, uh, community was, was really quite united in their desire that Israel should immediately withdraw from all territory um, captured as a result of this war. And Israel said two things. They said, number one, uh, this was not a war we started. This was a defensive war. And we've essentially captured the areas that from which we were attacked under international law, completely reasonable. And the second thing is this area 
when we're talking particularly now about Judea and Samaria, this area did not belong to Jordan. In fact, when Jordan held this area for 19 years, between 1948 and 1967, there was no international recognition of Jordan's claim to that area. The only two countries in the world that recognized Jordan's claim to that area were Great Britain and Pakistan. So Jordan's claim was not legal. And if we go back to the original, both the historical biblical claim of the Jewish people to that area, but also the legal claim deriving from the San Remo Treaty that we talked about earlier, that treaty clearly encompassed all of Israel, as we know today, all of Judea and Samaria, and therefore the original legal rights under international law to, to Israel were really placed very clearly in the hands of the Jewish people. Um, on the other hand, though, there was tremendous international pressure, and the government of Israel at the time was very hesitant about making any definite statements. The United States actually, um, at Israel's request, was very instrumental in ensuring that Resolution 242, for example, which referred to withdrawal, did not say withdrawal from all the territories or even withdrawal from the territories, but withdrawal from territory captured by Israel in that war, which means that Israel could satisfy its obligations under the resolution if it withdraw from any part of the territory. Now, over the years, um, Initially, Israel retreated from a very small part of, of the Golan Heights. Later on, Israel retreated from the entire Sinai. And uh, clearly, if Israel had any obligations under 242, those were satisfied completely. And there were no, there's no further reason, at least under that resolution, uh, to obligate Israel to withdraw any further. Now, immediately after the Six-Day War, there was already the beginnings of a settlement movement. Nobody called it a settlement movement. They just called it, let's go home, you know? So we had at first a, a group of people under the leadership of a man named Hanan Porat. These people had been children in 1948 when their community of Kfar Zion was under siege. Um, a few weeks into that siege, the mothers and children were evacuated to Jerusalem and a few months later, the night before Israel became a state, Kfar Etzion fell. And all the fathers that were there fighting were killed. The uh, children and their mothers were then distributed throughout the land, um, but they held on a sense of community, kept in touch with one another. And 19 years later, these children were now young men and women, some of whom had actually fought in the Six-Day War. In fact, Hanan Parat was a paratrooper who was part of the forces that liberated Jerusalem and then moved on with the army to take part in the liberation of his own hometown kibbutz of Kfar Tzion. So this group of people came to the Prime Minister of Israel just a few weeks after the war, requesting permission to go back and resettle their home, Kfar Tzion, and he immediately gave them permission. It was not official government decision. It was just a, a, a spontaneous response of Levi Eshkol, the Prime Minister of Israel, to this group of people, of course, go home. And they did. And they came and they started settling and gradually building up the kibbutz. It was not easy. The Arabs had actually destroyed almost all the original buildings, so they were starting from scratch. Uh, but they did it. And we saw, um, little by little, that area began to be developed. Um, the, the next important uh, milestone in the settlement movement again, before it was actually called a settlement movement, was the settlement of Hebron. As I mentioned earlier, Hebron had been settled for hundreds of years uh, before the Jews were um, cruelly evacuated from there uh, in 1929. And there was no real Jewish presence in Hebron from 1929 until 1967, after the war was over. So there were um, Jews who gathered together under the leadership of a man named Rabbi Levinger, and they went to celebrate the holiday of Passover in spring of 1968 in Hebron. They rented a hotel that was owned by an Arab in Hebron who was only too happy to receive the payment for use of the hotel. And they had an open-ended lease uh, for this hotel that for as long as they paid money, they could stay. And they came and they celebrated the holiday of, of Passover. And then after Passover, they stayed and suddenly the government of Israel realized they had Jews living in Hebron. Now, on the one hand, that was a very exciting 
um, development, Jews coming back to the oldest Jewish city, uh, the city where Abraham dwelled, the city where our forefathers Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah are all buried in the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs. But uh, on the other hand, they were very frightened because these same Arabs that had massacred Jews in, in 1929 were still there. Uh, their children, their grandchildren, uh, with enormous hate uh, against the Jewish people. So the government of Israel was also very frightened. Could they protect these few Jews who had so bravely gone to live in the middle of what included a very hostile Arab population? Uh, and at the same time, they were very concerned about international pressure that was already being put on Israel to withdraw from all of these areas. Um, for the most part, the government decided not to decide. Uh, at some point, they moved the Jews out of the hotel and put them into a military compound. And this was in line with their decision not to decide uh, because they figured the conditions there were so difficult that the, the Jews would leave on their own. But of course, they didn't. Um, this was a very hardy group, even living in terrible, terrible conditions. They, they stayed and they thrived and they survived and, and eventually the government realized that they were here to stay and they initiated the building of the town of Kiryat Arba. Now Kiryat Arba, of course, is a synonym in the Bible for Hebron and so it was a fitting name for this new modern suburb of Hebron that was going to be built adjacent and actually walking this easy walking distance to the ancient area of Hebron where the tomb of the Machpelah, the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs is located and the original Jewish neighborhoods from back um, in, in the 16th through the early part of the 20th century. Kiryat Arba was built in the early 1970s and Jews started moving in. Those were the first two uh, main events that began settlement before it was actually called a settlement movement. After that, things kind of, there were a bit of development. Um, there was some army uh, slash civilian settlements being set up in, uh, in the Jordan Valley, even a bit in the Gaza Strip, where the government felt because of security uh, and defense considerations, it was important to have a Jewish presence in these areas. Um, and then that brings us to 1973, when the Yom Kippur War breaks out. Um, in October of 1973, Israel uh, was surprised and attacked by Syria and uh, Egypt. Notice Jordan did not join the attack. They had learned their lesson uh, from 1967, but it was a very, very traumatic time, a very bloody war, it took some time until Israel was able to turn the tide. Uh, at the end of the war, of course, they ended up just a few miles from Damascus in the north and from Cairo in the south, had the Egyptian army surrounded in the Sinai, and uh, Israel did end uh, holding the upper hand, but at tremendous cost. When that war was over, there was a, a sort of, I would say, a wake-up call that many people felt here in Israel, uh, we have neglected to settle this area of Judea and Samaria that we were given uh, so miraculously just six years earlier. Uh, just to have a, a Kiryat Arba, Hebron area, and to have um, you know the, the Gush Etzion area, nothing had been settled in Samaria at that point and very little in Judea. And this is when the settlement movement really began in earnest. Uh, beginning in 1974, this group of people set their sights on Elon Moreh, the Oak of Moreh. They called themselves Elon Moreh, and their goal was to settle somewhere near Shechem, uh, either on the original mountain that uh, is the Oak of Moreh or somewhere nearby. And um, they, a number of attempts, uh, seven different failed attempts, uh, the eighth attempt uh, succeeded. That was in December of 1975. I was actually in Israel at the time and was very swept at that point by what has, had already become a very large popular movement in Israel to force what was then a labor government to approve and encourage Jewish settlement in Judea and Samaria. And this was the, break, the breakthrough. Shimon Peres, actually, who was then defense minister and Yitzhak Rabin, who were who was prime minister, they were the ones who ultimately realized this was a huge popular movement and they had to give them something. So they agreed that a small group, 30 families, could settle in an army camp called Kadum, which was west of Shechem. And uh, 
I went out there to that army camp just two weeks after it had been established. The conditions were really horrible. I mean, this was an army camp. Families were living in an army camp. The visitors came. We, we slept in tents. It was freezing. It was January 1976. It was just, you know, crazy, freezing cold. Um, but it was an experience I will never forget because I was able to witness and experience firsthand the passion and the dedication and the faith of these few people who were determined one tiny baby step at a time to settle the land. And I looked at these people myself. I remember at the time I was only 18, but I thought I knew it all. And I looked at these people who are only a few years older than me. And you think in terms of what will change the world, you think that it has to be armies or presidents or prime ministers, important people. These people are the ones who are gonna change the world and make a difference. And here you have people who are literally in their 20s, a few in their 30s, those were the old ones, you know, who are doing this amazing ideological str struggle on such a small level. And you're saying to yourself, what could this possibly accomplish? How can this small group of people, okay, very, very nice. They now get themselves permission to live in an army camp. What will that do in the, in the great scheme of things? How are we going to accomplish anything? But I was wrong and they were right because they understood that all you needed to do is have individuals who had the passion, the ideology, and the conviction that what they were doing was right. They need to do what they could. And they were confident that God would bless their efforts and open the door for much more settlement. And that's exactly what happened. Um, the real next turning point, of course, was in May of 1977, when Menachem Begin became the first prime minister from the Likud party. Since Israel's inception in 1948, it was the Labour Party who ruled. It was a largely secular party that was very um, uh, willing to compromise on where the borders of Israel would be. Menachem Begin represented a far more traditional biblical oriented perspective and one of great pride as he stood before all the nations of the world and basically said, this is Jewish, this is Israel, it is not yours. And I remember as a, um, I was in college at the time in, in New York in 1977, shortly after he became Prime Minister, Menachem Begin came to the States and he was interviewed on a very popular uh, interview program on national television. And I remember him saying, you know, this is not occupied West Bank. This is biblical Judea and Samaria. And I remember feel like I would have like stood up and cheered because to have a Prime Minister of Israel stand with such pride against people who spoke to him with such derision just filled me with amazing pride and it gave me the ability to identify so strongly with him as a leader and with the values that he represented. Um, thanks to Menachem Begin, the, the door was really opened for major settlement. Uh, and in the years between 1977 and 1984, most of the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria that we see today, their foundations were let, laid right then. Um, to, and that what started as very small here a community, there a community, very often the communities began with a few mobile homes or with other temporary residential structures and, until they were able to um, get organized enough until the government was able to um, put it all into practice uh, legally and, and, and logistically to actually bring the infrastructure and build a proper community. Uh, but that's how, how the, uh, the foundations were laid in by very brave people who lived in often very difficult circumstances. Uh, people that I speak to today and they talk about those days and they talk about how, you know, electricity, they, they had electricity being provided by generators and it could not accommodate, you know, everybody's washing machine. So people took turns using their washing machine. Forget about dryers. Nobody had dryers. No one had enough electricity for a dryer. Um, and it was just, it was just a very difficult time, but these people had such faith and, and such um, ideology and such a strong spirit about them that they knew that each one of them as whatever they're doing in their own little way really was making a difference. And they were so right. It made an enormous difference. Uh, I was privileged to move to Israel um, only in 1984 when by that time I was married, my husband and I, from the time we got married, were determined to move to Israel, but we needed to finish school and, uh, and, and earn a bit of money. And we came, we had been married just five years. 
Uh, we had two children at the time. Our oldest was just two, and we had our second child, who was an infant, just a few months old, and we moved to Israel. And as soon as we arrived, really within a couple of weeks of landing in Israel, we already signed a contract to build our home in Samaria, in what was then a new neighborhood being built in the community of Karnei Shomron. And we have lived here ever since. We, we, of course, signed our contract in 84, but it took a few years until the house was ready and we could move in. Uh, there were all kinds of problems along the way, but eventually in the summer of 1987, we were able to move into our home and we have been living here in the home here in my library where, where we are sitting here together. Um, this is where we have lived since 1987. And we had three more children uh, after moving to Israel. Um, now, of course, they are all grown and we have seven grandchildren, six grandsons and one granddaughter. So we ourselves feel that we ha have uh, had the privilege to live and experience and literally take part in the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, now, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy for us personally. It hasn't been easy for anybody. Um, initially, when we came here, um, you know, there wasn't very much in the way of uh, shops and services. It, it, there was a lot of inconveniences involved, but we felt very safe. Um, at the end of 1987, beginning of 1988, we they started what became known as the first Intifada. And that was the first time that we saw organized Arab violence against us. Uh, the simplest things um, as we drove to and from um, shopping or, or taking the children to doctor's appointments or whatever. As I said, the infrastructure here was so minimal that we had to drive out of Samaria to the larger cities to get almost anything. Um, and we started those, those, small, those, tr those journeys ended up being fraught with danger as Arabs would find every opportunity to throw stones, rocks, boulders at our cars. People were killed, people were injured. It was a terrible, terribly difficult time. Um, it was frightening for me. I remember I was a young woman and um, very uh, during the day, you know, I worked or I was I worked part time or I was at home, but I was the one who was more with the children. My husband would be out all day and very often, you know, I had to make that decision. Um, should I pack the kids in the car and go out or should I stay home? And it was not an easy time at all. Things kind of calmed down a bit after that in, in the early 90s. Uh, and then in 1993, um, we were totally surprised when uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who was then the Prime Minister of Israel the second time, uh, after he had defeated uh, Yitzhak Shamir in the Likud-led government, he ushered in a whole new process called the Oslo process, which unfortunately was billed as a peace process. But what he did was he rehabilitated Yasser Arafat, who until that point had been recognized all over the world as an arch terrorist, and, and recognized him and... Um, his PLO terrorist organization suddenly became a legal uh, authority, the Palestinian Authority, and uh, they were they were recognized by Israel, um, and uh, negotiations began, where the ultimate goal was either some kind of Palestinian state or some quasi state, but right away already Israel transferred huge areas of Israel to the Palestinian Authority. And suddenly we living in Judea and Samaria were surrounded not only by Arab villages, but by Arab villages who were uh, under the authority of a Palestinian Authority who themselves had their own police who had guns. Initially, the, um, the understanding was that when the Israeli government gave guns to the Palestinian Authority, that they were supposed to be their allies in, in uh, capturing the terrorists. Now, none of us believe that would have happened. I don't know the people who actually did it. Maybe they were naive enough to believe that actually these people who just yesterday were terrorists trying to murder Jews are suddenly today going to be our angels and help us murder the terrorists. They themselves were the terrorists. It was absurd. And so what happened was exactly what we had predicted. These uh, terror, the so-called Palestinian Authority uh, was never a real uh, uh, authority, what it was, was the foundation of a terrorist mini-state. And um, little by little, they built their infrastructure until we had a full-blown terrorist war that began in the year 2000, when Arabs um, 
attacked, not just attacked Jews, but now they had guns and now they had, um, they had uh, bombs and they had a lot of material and, and infrastructure that they were able to put together because Israel had withdrawn from those areas a number of years earlier. Um, even uh, at the time there were joint patrols between Israel and the Palestinian Authority where uh, Palestinian soldiers and Israel's, Israeli soldiers patrolled together. And what happened is that Intifada began with the Palestinian soldiers turned and shot and murdered those Israeli soldiers that they had been patrolling with just 30 seconds earlier. So it was a terrible, terrible breakdown. Um, again, those of us who were very um, active and, and part of the settlement movement never really trusted that this agreement would have been good anyway. Although there's always a part of you that hopes that yes, indeed it will bring peace uh, and, and we will have peaceful coexistence between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Um, but we never really believed that would happen. And indeed, our fears um, materialized. And uh, we saw unbelievable terrorist activity, uh, buses blowing up in the cities and, and cafes and all kinds of stuff and ongoing attacks against the Jews who live and travel in Judea and Samaria. Finally, that died down uh, in about 90, uh, excuse me, in 2004. By 2004, things were much quieter. And since then, um, Israel has steadily grown uh, in, its, um, in its position. In general, Israel has, has improved so much since then. Our, economically, we are so much better off than we were. Um, so much has developed. But here in Judea and Samaria, we have continued to grow. And, and it's really an amazing thing. I remember when I moved to Israel in 1984, uh, there were barely 80,000 Jews in all of Judea and Samaria. And today we are close to half a million Jews. Now we would be well over a million Jews if we hadn't had so many political obstacles um, and, and, and terrorist obstacles to growing our population. But in recent years, the population has just taken off. And in fact, we, we need much more building than we even have because the demand has far um, out, outgrown the, the, the supply of homes. Uh, and of course, over the years when, for example, when President Obama was in office in the United States, he exerted enormous pressure and, and prevented the go government of Israel from issuing more than a handful of building permits. And, and after he left office or towards the, actually towards the end of his office already at a point at which Israel realized that no matter what we did, uh, Obama was not going to be happy. Netanyahu began issuing more and more building permits. And so the building that we're seeing today is a result of some of those permits. Um, if you look now in where we are, uh, we are in a position where we are facing um, real opportunity with uh, Trump's new plan and whether or not that will move forward, of course, remains to be seen. But our vision is for Israel to be here in the land of Israel, all of the land of Israel forever. Um, even if right now we are not all over Judea and Samaria, our communities are in certain areas, some of which extremely important biblically. Um, at this point, we need to do everything we can to, to strengthen and grow in the areas where we are already. Um, someone will ask me, well, what are you gonna do with all the Arabs there? Are you ever gonna end up really exerting control over the entire area? What about the areas that have already been transferred to the Palestinian Authority? What will happen there? And my answer is, I have no idea how it's going to happen, but I do know it will. Because remember, in, in back in Genesis 12, when God said, I will give this land to your children. And do you remember a few verses later when God says to Abraham that it will be an everlasting possession? I believe that that is a promise that God will fulfill. And sometimes we have to be patient. And sometimes the fulfillment of these promises take time and they are done very, very gradually, but they do happen. And this is something that we are witnessing today. I just want to conclude my story with verses from Ezekiel, which to me express more than any other, well, actually Ezekiel and then another verse from Amos, but these verses are something that they were written and spoken thousands of years ago, towards the end of the first temple period. And these verses never did come true, but we are witnessing coming them true today for the first time 
in thousands of years. And let me read to you, Ezekiel 36, verse 8. Oh, but you, O mountains of Israel, shoot forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel, for they are soon to return. I will multiply upon you, man, all the house of Israel, all of it. The cities will be resettled and the ruins will be rebuilt. I will multiply upon you, man, animals, and you will be fruitful and multiply. And I will settle you there as your forefathers. And I will prosper you more than in the early days. And you shall know that I am your God. And I drive around my community today and I see the beautiful blooms and flowers and trees. And I just read these verses and I know that we in our days are witnessing for the first time ever the fulfillment of that prophecy in Ezekiel 36. And I would just like to end with the promise that God makes through the prophet Amos, the last verse of Amos, Amos 9, verse 15. And I will plant you on your land, never again to be uprooted from your land that I have given you, says the Lord your God. God bless you.